Oh yeah, so um, I apologise for this, this is going to be a bit more of a thinky video. Uh, let me just angle this camera up a little bit so you've got a bit more of my ugly mug in it. There we go. So yeah, the problem with this is it makes everything look a bit wonky, but there you go. It's not wonky, the spirit level says it's flat. Well, recently flat anyway. So, uh, uh, transcription, yeah, this is a confusing term. This is something that people say a lot, you know, you've got to transcribe, transcribe to, 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 um, to learn the language, to learn how to play jazz. Um, I think transcription is an awful term. It's, it's, it's really bad. It's a bit like um, uh, improvisation, another equally meaningless term. Oh, you need to improvise. What does improvisation mean? Nobody seems to know. It's like, well, you know, uh, this guy competes and he played pretty much the same thing every night sometimes, or had blocks that he can move around, whereas Sonny Rollins would just make stuff up off the top of his head, you know. I mean, nobody really knows what improvisation is, right? It's, it's, just, um, it's just a blanket term for things that aren't written down. Um, you know, uh, which, which really reflects the fact that nobody really has a faint clue what's going on in a jazz performance, apart from people who study jazz. Um, but in fact, um, maybe that's a good thing, I don't know. But yeah, so transcription, I mean, like in classical use of the term transcription, it can mean taking a piece from one instrument and putting it on another. So Andrei Segovia transcribes a cello suite for, for the guitar, you know, for example. Um, obviously not our understanding of it in jazz. Um, uh, classical musicians talk about dictation, which means you hear a musical phrase and you write it down. So that's kind of close to what we're talking about, perhaps. Um, but I think really what transcription is, is it's, a, it's another example, along with the Greek names of the, of the modes, of uh, pseudo-academic terminology being grafted onto something which wasn't initially academic. So I'm going to talk about what I think is the history of transcription and where it comes from. So the earliest jazz was played before, before the era when it was recorded, right? So the earliest musicians, such as Buddy Bolden, famously, um, were never recorded. And Buddy Bolden has become obviously a sort of legendary figure, you know, e even by the standards of the jazz world, just because you know, no, no, nobody heard him. Um, and, and everything we know about him is based on, on second-hand evidence, you know? But obviously Buddy Bolden was tremendously influenced on the musicians around him, including Louis Armstrong, who was recorded. So... Um, the earliest learning of, of this music can, can only have been based on scores from some of the more kind of educated, perhaps Creole musicians, uh, more kind of classically trained musicians, and perhaps the street musicians, they would just be picking up tunes by ear and uh, hearing as much as they can. And actually, um, this is interesting because um, by, by people's ears uh, must have been better back then. And it, uh, you hear stories like about Richard Boner, for example, is coming from... Um, perhaps, perhaps, uh, perhaps a, a place, you know, a, a, an environment where recordings are not quite so common, at least when he was growing up. Uh, and and um, there are stories about him being able to pick up music extremely quickly, like just be able to listen to Jacob Pistorius lines and just be able to re re reproduce them right away. It's like, you know, obviously, you know, he's kind of in the top percentile of talent. Um, uh, but it reminds you people like Mozart, um, Jimi Hendrix is apparently able to do the same stuff, you know, whoever. Um, so having good oral memory and, and attention to detail um, is obviously something that preceded the recording era. So later on you get this thing where people have 78s and recordings for Louis Armstrong and everything else. And about this sort of time you start to see the first like jazz books coming out, as it were, you know, like the, uh, the like uh, 20 uh, Louis Armstrong cornet solos uh, transcribed, you know, or written down um, for you to learn on your, on your cornet. Um, Eddie Lang's Fingerboard Harmony, it's a book I've got, it wasn't actually written by Eddie Lang, but it's just basically, you know, lonely triads, right, <laughs> you know, <laughs> good advice for any era, um, all written in notation, um, quite intimidating for modern guitarists, uh, later on you have George Van Epp's books, and so on and so forth, so I mean, the, the, the publishing industry was, you know, not slow, the music publishing industry was not slow to get onto the idea of, oh, maybe we should have, like, educational guides, but obviously it's nothing like what we have today, and most people would have been learning this record strictly by, uh, this music, strictly by ear, by uh, transcribing the music that they heard on records. And this was probably a lot easier to do, because there were less records, right? So it was possible to keep up with the, the hot releases, so for example, Ray Brown talks about this club he was in at school, where in order to get access to the club you had to um, be able to sing the latest hot record that week, which was, you know, maybe, I don't know, uh, Lester Young or something, you know, you had to be able to sing that solo all the way through then and get in. That's something that's achievable because, you know, you've got a week to do it and get the record and you learn it, okay? And much of this stuff is, you know, it's just like listening to the record, the record that you love, over and over again until you just learn it. And I think, haven't we all got experience with that? I mean, I, 
When I was just getting into jazz, I used to listen all the time to this record by the Brecker Brothers, Return of the Brecker Brothers, I think it's their second album. Um, fusion album, lots of tricky stuff in it, lots of hits, lots of stops. But I know all of it, you know, and this is before I was really a proper musician. I didn't really play the guitar very well at that point. I hadn't had any sort of formal ear training or any, any really conception of anything about musicianship. I was pretty, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty uh, untrained at that point. So, you know, I, I, I just, but I just remembered all that stuff. Like, I listened to the record again 20 years on. I'm like, yeah, remember that, you know, and I could sing along with it, you know. Um, so I think that capacity exists within anybody, really. Um, anybody's interested in music, whether they, they play or not. That, that, that is our intrinsic sort of musical imagination. Um, but obviously, you know, you can focus that through, through training. But this is not necessarily the same as playing an instrument. So at this point in the 40s and 50s we start to see the first academic teaching of jazz and, and I think one important school is the less as the um, sorry before you slip there the Lenny Tristano school where wherein um, a sort of cornerstone of that is learning to sing solo so you'll sing a Leslie Young solo all the way through as well as you possibly can and then you'll pick up your instrument and you'll play it and this is um, obviously fantastic training uh, many people have come through the Tristano school but it's also obviously a kind of formalization of what people were already doing obviously then he was thinking hmm, how can I take something which is actually done you know by talking to I don't know Charlie Parker and people like that that's what they did so you know how do I turn this into a classroom exercise and that's pretty much what he did and it's still used today, you know. It's just a very good, very good bit of training for anybody, really. Um, it's quite hard to do, I have to say. Um, and so on and so forth. And then we get this idea of transcription and various jazz educators now who extol various kinds of transcription, whether it's writing things down, whether it's just studying licks and inserting them into your playing, or whether it's full-on Tristano-style learning solos by ear and everything else. So it sort of covers a wide raft of different approaches, all of which I think have something to offer. So, for example, if, if I listen to music and I write it down, that's going to improve my knowledge of, of, of notation. So next time when I read some music, I'm probably going to have more of an idea of how that sounds before I play it, right? It's ear training straight to paper. Might not necessarily help me play it, if you hear a lick and you play it on the guitar, then you develop the ability perhaps to, to play, um, uh, if, if you do it right away, if, if you just practice right away, then you develop the ability to repeat phrases, which is very important. Um, but if you do it uh, and, and it, you know, it's quite hard and you have to work on it a bit, then you'll probably develop your, your technique, right? Learning a whole solo all the way through by ear will improve your musical memory and your sense of the musical architecture of the solo. This is easier, obviously, in the swing and bebop era because the records were shorter, whereas now um, solos, recorded solos can go on for several choruses. Not so much on albums. Uh, on albums, they tend to be quite short, but in, uh, in performances, uh, you've got a lot more information there. I mean, you can even hear that. That's what they were doing even back in the uh, late swing era, at least, because uh, Charlie Christian's solos on the Minton's uh, live recordings are, are much more extensive than anything he did on the Benny Goodman sides and I don't think it was just because Benny Goodman was more of a commercial band I think he probably would have stretched out more and there's stories about it obviously his uh, 20 minute version of Rose Room that was his audition for the Benny Goodman band being a, a classic example so you know obviously live recordings they stretch more so it's like um, but you know uh, recorded so, so you, you kind of uh, there's different ways you can respond to them and uh, I think, I don't want to say any of them are right or wrong, but I think when you approach transcription, it's worth thinking about how is this going to um, impact on my playing? What do I want to get out of this? So it's beyond just thinking like, oh, transcription is good. It's, good. it's like improvisation. It's like your improvisation practice might be, oh, I shall try and fit this one line over every single chord. But then it might also be like, I'm going to try and take the melody of the song and change it a little bit each time, you know. Or it might be, I'm going to just play the scale going from the bottom of my instrument to the top of my instrument, right through the changes, without changing direction. You know, you can think of loads of ways, and these are all forms of improvisation. They're forms of um, constricted improvisation, uh, where you're, um, there's a Hal Crook book, for example, on it, which I need to get, which, which has loads of this stuff, apparently. But it's just like, you know, it's ways of kind of, you know, maybe, maybe taking a direction, uh, playing in a slightly different direction, or, you know, working something into your playing or, or, or making something more familiar, you know, whatever it is. And I think transcription is like that. And I think the important thing about transcription that a lot of people miss is that it's not about imitating 
the player you're copying. I mean, it can be, and uh, for example, listening to early recordings of Charlie Parker, it's quite obvious that he has learned all the Lester Young that he can find, because that's how he plays. He plays Lester Young licks. And then at some point, something goes on in his head, he goes, ding, and then suddenly, probably maybe the move to alto even, does something simple like that, unlocks this kind of tide of, of new rhythm and new ideas, which is, of course, Charlie Parker's own style. Um, but it's interesting that it took him a little while to get there, you know, and, and it seemed to be quite a rapid evolution in his play. Um, you know, so uh, you can go through a period of imitating, and that's perfectly okay, but it has to be a period, because eventually you have to find your own voice. I would say in a wider sense, for me now, I mean, I kind of went through it, go through periods of imitating musicians, I went through a period of imitating Charlie Christian for a bit, you know, quite recently, just because I loved his playing so much, you know, I just wanted to sound like him, you know, all, all that all that swing, and, and you know, the, the, the angularity of his playing, um, which is perhaps quite an adolescent thing to do, but I just wanted to do it, so, you know, can't be bad really, can it? Um, so you go through these periods and you do these things, uh, but then the ultimate aim is to find your own voice. And I think one thing about transcription that's quite interesting is that it, it really models imp the act of improvisation, which is, or the act of playing music. It's improvisation, composition, these are just arbitrary labels. Now, improvisation can be instant composition, or it can be the combination of ideas that you've already pre-composed, or it can be more likely both. Or you could be playing composition by memory, which is a very similar process. Like at, at, at the top of the mountain, there's no difference between improvisation and composition and performance. They're all the same thing. Uh, but a great performer of classical music has to become one with the composer of that music. And they have to try and get an insight into the way that they might have thought or might have been feeling about their music. And you're doing the same thing when you transcribe, because you are um, listening to a phrase, you are studying it in intense detail, and then you are trying to imagine it really big and loud in your head so that you can play it, right? That's the way you need to transcribe. If you transcribe and you're not doing that, then I think your playing of the transcription will come across as a little weak and a little, you know, a little, um, a little flat. On the other hand, if you, do, if you don't do that when you're improvising, your playing will come across as a little weak and a little flat, okay? Um, anyway, the, the How Galbra exercise, which I might put in another video, um, talk about that and kind of covers that area. So I think transcription is very powerful like that, and it's about, it's about educating your ear. Um, but it's kind of clunky that we've got this T word, you know, because really what it is, is it's just intense listening to music, and there's all kinds of different ways to listen to music. You want to get to the point where you can just listen to some music and understand what's going on in it, and, and maybe pick out a phrase and just repeat it, you know, without thinking. That's where you want to be, right? Transcription is just, you know, a, a sort of stepping stone on, on, that, on that quest really. Um, and it, it just reminds me, I think there's something very, like learning other people's solos and other people's music, there's something very egoless about it, and it's kind of an apprenticeship to it, which I think is a really great thing, really beautiful thing. So, you know, the way an artist might study another artist's brush strokes, the way they use colour, the composition of their, you know, of, of, of their painting, all that kind of stuff. There's a kind of humbleness about that, because you, and I, I think this is shared by musicians who are really good, because they kind of they're always in awe of somebody, you know, <laughs> they're always going like, you know, that, that person is amazing, I, you know, every time I listen to their music I hear more, and, um, you know, you hear that a lot, and I think, unless you train your ears and your perceptions to be able to understand, you know, deeply what's going on, then that's, that's never going to be the case. But then on the other hand, the interesting thing about learning to hear music is that no two people hear in the same way. Um, the things that interest me that I pick out when I when I listen to to music um, are, are kind of based around my own interests and my own well, what hits me in the gut or in the heart or whatever. But I'll be totally different maybe to what to what interests you. And the act of listening is therefore very personal and, and, and has to do with your own creativity and your own voice. So by listening to music, by choosing things that you love, rather than being told by somebody, oh, you should do this, oh, you should transcribe Charlie Parker. Why? I have to transcribe Charlie Parker. I mean, I kind of transcribed Charlie Parker because I thought I should, and then I ended up loving him, so, you know, it wasn't necessarily a terrible thing. But, you know, why, why do you have to do this? You know, why, why do you have to transcribe anybody? Transcribe what you love, you know? 
because it won't be hard work. And also by doing that, you're making, um, you're actually creating your own voice because you're choosing the things that interest you. And that's very much the same as improvising, in my opinion. Improvising, you know, from, from, your, from, from your own ears and your own sensibility. Um, which is not to say that sometimes you shouldn't be guided, you know. Um, finally, I just wanted to say something about this, the sort of YouTube genre of playing along with your, your recorded solo. So you learn your solo, you know, um, whoever it is, and then you, you do a YouTube video of you playing along with it as perfectly as you can. And I've, I've done one of these myself, I'll put a link below. Um, and I'm sort of thinking, hmm, is that cool or not? And I'm not quite sure, because performance of somebody else's solo, a lot of people would, from the older generation, would say that was a bit lame, you know, but it's very common practice now. And I think this, this has a lot to do with the kind of um, curatorial and historical kind of academic attitudes that people have now towards jazz. It's like, learning tradition isn't just like, oh, I grew up in New Orleans and this is the music that was around me, you know, or I bought all the Charlie Parker 78s as they came out and learned them until, you know, played them until they were dust, you know? It's like more like, oh, I go to university and I'm taught about the history of jazz and this is what I need to learn and this is what I should learn, you know, this, and, and now, now I'm in a... You know, it's, it's got a bit more that kind of feeling about it. But it is a fantastically um, uh, good thing to do, I, I found, for, for my technique and for, you know, really getting into learning something. Like, like playing music on YouTube is, is really very, um, very demanding because you're under the microscope. This is very much like recording, but I think it's even worse because there's something about having the image there. Um, if I record something, I feel less on the spot because when I'm videoing something, like, uh, it's even more kind of on the spot in a weird sort of way. Um, so, you know, that, that, that is really good, and uh, obviously it's tremendously impressive when you see these guys playing. But, you know, there are a few videos that I've seen which are fantastically impressive. Like, there's a guy, um, again, I'll try and stick a link below, but there's a guy doing a, um, you know, a Cannonball Adderley solo, which is, which is not easy to do on guitar, and he nails it. It sounds fantastic. But then there's no videos of him playing in a, in, 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 you know, in a, in a gig, really, or a jazz gig. So I kind of think, well, is that person a good player or not? You know, what... How do they play? Um, so there is also a sort of element of hiding behind somebody else's music sometimes when you do that. Um, it's, it's a known thing. People can say, oh, oh, they, they, they've really mastered that solo, so that means they're good. You know, it's a sort of, you know, you can put a linear yardstick up against it, which makes it a bit more like classical music a little bit, doesn't it? Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but I think um, putting your own music out there and saying, like, this is something I've written, or this is something, you know, I'm playing on this old standard, this is my own take on that, um, does put you in a position of more vulnerability, and also it's harder to evaluate this some things. You know, some, some people will love you playing, some people might hate it, at least if it's any good, you know, it has something to say. I mean, if you're just trying to imitate, you know, Kenny Burrell or something, then people can say, oh, you've done a very good imitation of Kenny Burrell, oh, you've done not such quite a good uh, imitation of Kenny Burrell, you know, they, they can evaluate you in that way. But if you're saying, like, this is my music that I do, then there's no way to kind of evaluate that beyond people's personal responses to that. So I think it's kind of a bit like trying to make music into a science a little bit, um, which can be useful in some ways. You know, it can certainly improve your craft and your artisanship and your ears and your technique and everything else. But I think ultimately for that to become the aim, I think might be why jazz hasn't really moved on that much in 40 years or, you know, you, you, you have... You have a lot of music, which, you know, in the pop charts, for example, which is just reproductions of old music, you know. Oh, we're going to try and make this sound like Motown or whatever, you know. It's kind of a little bit how culture is now, and you can't escape those forces. You know, I, I play in bands which reproduce, you know, uh, music of Django Reinhardt. Um, you know, I'm doing a band now which is, you know... Uh, songs from the 50s and 60s, you know, but, but I would, I'd like to think in both cases that I'm doing something which is, you know, I mean, in the case of the, the 50s, 60s bands, I am actually singing, so, you know, my, my voice is actually part of that, I can't get away from that, my voice sounds a certain way, uh, however I want to try and change it and blend with the other guys in the band, you know, it's always going to sound a certain way, um, and the instrumentation I'm using is quite different as well, so, you know, there is always a sort of element of, I, I don't think I'd be interested in just reproducing something perfectly, well, there might be, because it's an interesting exercise, but I think I would get tired of it. 
Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting paradox between imitating and honouring the past and, and developing your own, your own voice. But I don't think transcription is about imitation. I think it's about what hits you and what you're interested in working on. And it's about refining your, your ears. Um, and I don't think it's about taking away your own personal uh, voice in music at all. In fact, quite the opposite. Anyway, um, yeah, let, let me know what you think. Um, I don't have many answers, but I do have lots of questions. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. Anyway, bye.